Hello, everyone, and welcome back to Discussing a Murder Extras. Um, this extra today uh, deals with the deposition of Amy Lehman, and with me today is Big Jeff. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Thanks for having me on. It's really a pleasure to be able to sort of, you know, sh share the research that not only me, but the whole community has come together to provide with people who may not be exactly familiar with the full set of events that was sort of culminating, you know, the, uh, the 1985 lawsuit. So I think it's really important everybody understand this and, and, and you know, thanks for taking the time to, to have me on to talk about it uh, and, uh, you know, br bring this information forward to the, to the community. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks for coming, Jeff. And uh, for those of you that have been following along, we also did a video on the Deb Strauss deposition, and you can find that link in the description here. Um, but for today, we're talking about Amy Lehman. And Jeff, would you say that it was a team effort or one of them kind of played more of a role? Or was it, was it really two people conducting the investigation? Or was it senior and junior kind of partnership? Do, do you have a read on that? Yeah, so I, I, I have a read, you know, and, and in, like like anybody's uh, read, it's it's uh, it's completely conjecture. That wasn't along the line of questioning that was asked, but the impression that I got from from reading it that De that Deb Strauss is a little bit more senior, um, but supposedly they you know shifted the workload equally. Uh, but I think the most important part of my my read of this is that Amy Lehman, you know, is is not shy. Uh, about saying that she thinks, you know, about, about what about what she thinks. She doesn't really try uh, and hide a lot of it. There's a couple things where she, you know, get, goes quiet. Uh, but mostly, you know, she's pretty forthcoming with information, um, you know, that that she, that she that she recalls. So uh, I thought that that was I thought that that was interesting about 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 Amy. And of course, she does not uh, call Mark Wiegert on November <laughs> on November fourth. To ask to be involved in a case where everybody's talking about Stephen Avery before the rat was even found on his property. That's right. Amy Lehman did not make the phone call that said, I don't really like Stephen Avery, <laughs> which right. it doesn't reflect well on your report. But I always wondered that because she's, she does appear to be younger, and it d did appear that maybe that Deb was playing more of a, uh, you know, a front role in this. It, it, it does seem <clears throat> does seem like that a little bit. Um, so, but but we but we Amy does talk to uh, well, I, I think she talks to Jennifer Nashold a little bit, uh, and you'll recall that Jennifer Nashold is the person who actually wrote the first draft of the Peg Whitewash. Uh, and if we read her deposition, it's actually a great uh, Reddit post, and I think it's by Seeking Truth for Good. Uh, you know, just the, the whole, I mean, it should be noted that the whole reason why we have these depositions is because there was a massive crowdfunding campaign that took place in the, in the MAM community. Uh, and I think they, I, and the, these uh, tapes themselves were owned by a, uh, you know, a, a, a company who essentially sells them, right? And if you want the video, the, the video depositions were like out of price, but just the, the transcribed uh, depositions, I think, were five thousand dollars or something for all of the definitions, and it was a massive crowdfunding campaign. And you know, the, uh, the, the 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 written depositions themselves, they weren't widely disseminated uh, among the community. There were lots of hooks. It seems as though it's been resolved. As a matter of fact, uh, we should put a link to the Foul Play website uh, because they did a, a full reading of the uh, of, of the deposition. And this is just the highlights that I thought were, you know, particularly important moments from the deposition. So, yeah, absolutely. So thanks to everybody who worked to get this. And and the, the uh, and, and seeking truth for good actually wrote an excellent uh, Reddit post. You know that if we continue this series, if it, if if it's well received from Deb and Amy, then we can go over seeking truth for good. Uh, his reading on the Jennifer Nashold uh, deposition. Uh, and the interesting part of the Jennifer Nashold deposition is it seems as they were assembling, because what, what you're seeing is this, as, as the report went from, uh, you know, Amy and Deb, they, they, they would submit what you call uh, 529s, right? That they, if you work for the, for the uh, federal 
uh, or law enforcement, you do an interview report, right? After, after you go out and do some collection, those those interview reports typically are written on something called a Form 529. So if you hear the term 529, that's essentially an interview report. Um, so so uh, they would submit their 529s to Jennifer Nashold, and and they're they're not an attempt to be uh, a narrative, right? They're just interview reports. And Jennifer Nashold was the one who took them and began to assemble a, a, a story which was intended to become the, uh, you know, the Department of Justice's formal report. Uh, and uh, in Seeking Truth for Good, excellent uh, record, uh, Reddit article, uh, he, he starts to point out that, oh, you know what, they, they had a section on this, uh, in this report on Vogel. And that section just seems to have disappeared, completely edited out by the person who got it after Jennifer, who was Tom Fallon. The same Tom Fallon, who uh, served as assistant special counsel to Ken Kratz. So it's again, he, he, it's all the same people over and over again. It's just, it's unbelievable how, um, you know, you, you just, you just jump into this, it, you know, it's not even seven degrees of separation. It's like zero degrees of separation. It's it's all it's all the same people, and it's just. Uh, it's always the it's always the appearance of impropriety they're worried about, not the actual impropriety, yeah. right? Yeah. So so. so what so are we, we got on this uh, slide here? Yeah so, yeah. so we got in this this one. Okay. Uh, well, on on this slide, you know, if, if you if you take the time to read the depositions, um, th then uh, which which I, I I think you can probably get them. I'm not sure if they're available on the Fall Play website or not. I'd, ha I'd have to check that. But if you if you hunt hard enough, you can get the, you can get the depositions. Uh, the, the, there was a ton, even much more in this present, in this deposition than in the Deb Strauss deposition. The lawyers are constantly objecting, right? Objection, objection. If you want to know who all these lawyers are, uh, this is, this is the play. You can't tell the players without a program. This is the program for you, right? So who are Steven's lawyers? Well, Steven's lawyers, as you probably know, and maybe you can flash some cutouts from the, uh, you know, from, from the, from the man. He had two lawyers, Walt Kelly, uh, and, and uh, and Steven Glitt. Right, those those are his two civil rights lawyers, and they're present at the depositions. Uh, Dennis Vogel, who was individually named in the suit, had his own lawyer uh, there, uh, and that and that guy's name is Claude Cavelli. And so you know it'll it'll say the deposition attorney Cavelli uh, said said something. You'd have to look at this to know that it was uh, that that was Vogel's lawyer who said that. Also individually named in the suit was Tom Kasurik, moving to the right. Uh, and Tom Kasurik had his own individual lawyer being individually named in a log lawsuit named uh, uh, attorney Poland, Pollen, uh, Raymond Pollen. Uh, and moving down to the left, uh, the, the uh, Manitowoc County was also named as a defendant in the suit. So the Manitowoc County had a lawyer by the name of uh, Timothy Bascom. Uh, and then... Uh, uh, Deb Strauss and Amy Lynn, and that's a picture of Amy on the right. Very smart suit she's got on there, by the way. Um, her, uh, they, they share the same lawyer. It's not uncommon uh, for a state or a federal employee who gets uh, asked to testify in a lawsuit that their their job, if you will, uh, you know, uh, appoints a lawyer for them. And in this case, it was indeed a lawyer from the DOJ whose name is Corey Finkelmeyer. <laughs> Um, so uh, that, that's that's who, that's who all those lawyers are. If you want to read up in the in, in, the, in the deposition, so that, that that room is pretty crowded, right? That, so we got Amy, we got I think Stephen was probably present for this. Maybe Jody, uh, Stephen and Jody did go to a lot of them, and so that that and uh, none, none of the uh, accused uh, came to the depositions. So only the people who were being deposed, Amy and uh, uh, Deb, I think were on the same day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. Uh, and and Deb definitely went first, and uh, all these lawyers. So it was it was a pretty crowded room. So, uh, all right. So that that's the, that, that's all about that. Um, I guess you really have to be interested in the inside baseball to want to know who the lawyers are. But we'll get we'll get back to that later on in the in the in the presentation because it it's it's actually interesting to start to ferret out what certain of the lawyers are are saying. Right. That 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 becomes important. What are they objecting to? What are they saying? Um, and so, that object, uh, uh, objective form. They very often object to form, uh, which means they, they don't like the way that the question was phrased. 
Uh, but you right. very often, after you, they say objective form, you hear the, uh, the attorney say, you can answer. Because I, I think, man, it would be great to have, I wish Travis uh, could, could join us, uh, Travis Williamson. Uh, you know, he, who is a, who is a lawyer? I, I don't think that you're supposed to be objecting. It's very uncommon in a um, deposition that you get all these objections, and and that just speaks to how badly it was going for the state, how well it was going for Stephen. So, uh, you know, well, a, de a deposition a deposition is part of a legal process called discovery, right? So, if if you sue somebody, or um, you know, perhaps even you're a, uh, in, a, in, a in a criminal case and, and maybe a witness. Uh, what you do is, is uh, you know, as, as part of the the person who is doing the, you know, the, the accuser, the, the plaintiff, uh, who is usually the state in the case of a criminal, uh, uh, but it could be anybody in the case of a civil, in this case it was Stephen. If, if, if their complaint passes the threshold for, for moving forward, you're entitled to discovery. Part of discovery is uh, potentially asking people questions. And there really isn't a, a limit to, uh, you know, what you can, you know, the, the lawyers would say, ah, yeah, there's a limit. But, uh, you know, it's, if you're, as long as you're focused on, you know, sort of the scope of your suit, uh, you're free to ask anything you want, um, you know, re re related to the uh, case. And, you know, objective forum doesn't really have any bearing because it's only a, it, it's only a um, – you know, a process of obtaining information from the person being deposed. So as long as that person gives you an answer, that then, then you have that piece of information, which you are free to use or not, and either conducting your investigation further, or perhaps bringing it up in the actual civil trial, which is the you know the real time that you get in front of the court, right? It's, so so yeah, it's it's kind of it's kind of weird. Uh, I, I, I agree. I don't even understand really what the value of that uh, objection is. That, and, and as was pointed out in the dev deposition, uh, you know, some of the things that are brought up, this person said this about that other person. Well, that's hearsay. Hearsay is not admissible. Um, but it would give you as, uh, you know, as in, uh, you know, as a plaintiff, you know, the opportunity to say, okay, well, this person did say something about, so can, can I subpoena this person now for, for a deposition? Right. So that, that, that is kind of how, how that goes. So. So um, remember how we said that Deb Strauss was in uh, a narcotics? narcotics. Yeah. Um, guess what? So was Amy. <laughs> so you want to do the Q&A again like we did before? Yeah, sure. Uh, how, how long have you been employed at the Department of Justice? Since October of 1992. And prior to your service in the Public Integrity Unit, what units did you serve in? I worked in the White Collar Crime Bureau and Narcotics Bureau. Okay. And that question, that, uh, oh, how, how long each of those, please? I started in narcotics, worked there for five years, and then transferred to White Collar Crimes Bureau. And then when the Public Integrity Bureau was created, I put into that bureau. I was put into that bureau. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, it's interesting that... You know, again, the one of the rabbit holes I went down when I first started looking at this case in Narcos around a ASY is it because potentially they had, um, you know, th they had uh, they had investigative investigative experience there. I, you know, just thinking out loud uh, and you know going down that rabbit hole for a second. Um, isn't a salvage yard just a great place you can come where there's like nothing for a, where, where you could like pull off a drug deal so easy? Uh, you know, not saying any, anybody for the family or anything did did, did, did anything like that. Um, but they certainly had something to hold over the heads of some family members uh, that made them do things that were uh, not well didn't work well out, work didn't work out well for Stephen. Let's just say that. So. What, what might th might that be drug? I can you know I can see maybe drugs being a possible thing. We'll just never know. So moving on to the next slide, you know it would be good. To, you know I, I put uh, the Deb and Amy depositions side by side. So right. So right. Um, the question is to both of them, why did you do this? You know what why 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 were you here? Why did you perform this investigation? And that was essentially the question to Amy that I did not write down. So maybe you can start with Amy's response. 
It's my recollection that he brought the DA's case file is is my recollection. And I don't know specifically what made him come to us other than the fact that Avery was being released and he wanted it reviewed. Uh, did he describe to you the information that he was receiving from people in the courtroom after Stephen Avery had been exonerated and released about what people were saying they knew back in 1985 when this trial took place? I don't remember that, but it's possible. Okay. So keep in mind what they're talking about. If you remember, if you remember Deb Strauss's deposition, that there was a kickoff meeting, right? Um, and that kickoff meeting was held with Roar, Griesbach, uh, and, 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 one, and one other probably assistant DA at the time. So this question is about that meeting. Why, why would you hear, right? So they brought the file. Amy says, uh, you know, I don't really recall. He just, he wanted it reviewed, right? So when they right. asked Deb the same question, the question they posed to Deb was, at the meeting, did, did Mark Rohr report that he had been receiving information in the courthouse since the time that Stephen Avery's conviction had been vacated, that there were people who had been in the DA's office or the sheriff's office at the time who thought that Stephen Avery had not committed the crime and that Gregory Allen had, uh, and that they, they, Mark Rohr and his assistant, were very concerned about that? Yes. The answer is yes. So, so does it sound to you like they were even at the same meeting? I mean, <laughs> how can one of them say, yeah, I don't remember him saying anything about, uh, you know, any uh, buddy knowing anything peculiar at the DA's office or saying anything like that? Um, she's like, yeah, it I just, don't remember. <laughs> it, is the, it is the point, right? It is the big point on why you would open an investigation like this. Yeah. It, yeah. You'd be like, well, why are we doing this? You know, why, why, why are we having this kickoff meeting? What was the evidence that indicated we should open a case? And then the answer is, well, there had been <laughs> talk in the sheriff's office at the time that they thought Stephen Avery didn't do it and that Gregory Allen did it. Oh, okay. I mean, that's the whole purpose of the kickoff meeting, right? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And Deb it's even goes like, on, right? Getting a detail, right? Yeah, yeah. 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 Like, why are we here? <laughs> it's right. very difficult it's to, to to do a study, <laughs> right? If you don't have a thesis statement, right? So if you if you if you if any any type of researcher knows that you you know you have to have, you have to formulate a thesis statement to continue the research. Uh, that's just the scientific method. And uh, Amy seems to have lost the bubble a little bit on that. Um, and look what Deb goes on to say after that question, right? Um, I believe it was the driving force behind the, uh, the behind him coming and requesting the investigation. You know, it's the driving force, but that's, that's a little force. bit more. I mean. <laughs> right. It's the whole point of the meeting, right? This is the this is the key issue, right? And she can't yeah. remember. If, but it's possible. <laughs> but it's possible. Yeah. So <laughs> maybe. It's just like she's she's like I don't want to say anything that goes against anybody at all ever, right? Yeah. Yeah. She she says some things she's not shy about later, and, and it kind of almost speaks to your question. It's gonna be like you know where where, where, I, where I work. It's gonna be the more senior people who remember the directives from the higher ups than the junior people, and that's one of the things that drove me to answer the your your first question the way that I did. It does seem like Deb's a little bit more senior. She's taking the guidance from the. Uh, from the DA and Amy, maybe a little bit more junior and maybe a little bit more along for the ride. When you were at the kickoff meeting in your own, like, did this, did this main event happen? And she's, <laughs> well, it's possible that someone could have talked about the main, the main topic of the meeting. You just yeah. look like a fool, right? You're kind of embarrassing yeah. yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah, and that happened to Deb Strauss a lot, and that's probably why she ended, didn't end up liking Stephen Avery very much, would be my guess. There you go. <laughs> only a guess. I don't know for sure. I can only, I can only speculate. Um, so, so maybe moving on to the next. As, as we as we talked about this, and th th I, I found some of this, uh, I, I found this particular exchange stunning. Um, and as we know, right, we've said before, we played the. Um, you know, we, we, we played the, the Mike Griesbach uh, tape where he's speaking to the, you know, to the, to the, uh, on the panel for the wrongful conviction. 
Uh, and he's saying, you know, that Bergner went to Kasurik, and not only did he go to Kasurik, but he bought Penny Bernstein with, him. and that is that's just phenomenal. And and so and what Kasurik and what um, what Griesbach does not say in that interview is, well, how soon after Stephen got arrested did that happen? Right. So we we don't really know that, or we haven't provided evidence of that other than asserting it, uh, in, in in what we've said till now. Um, as part of the definite as part of the depositions, though, uh, both of the uh, Strauss and Lehman do agree that it was it had been important to identify whether or not information about Gregory Allen had been uh, delivered from the Manitowoc Police Department to the MTSO, the Sheriff's Office, specifically Kasurik. Um, and so, uh, you know, um, you might recall that Deb didn't know or recall too much about that. Uh, so Amy knew, Amy knows a little bit more. So let's run through maybe her questioning in this area. Okay, and one of the tasks that you and Ms. Strauss and the lawyers who are working with you had set was to determine whether or not the information known to the city of Manitowoc Police Department detectives was somehow communicated by one or more of them to the sheriff of the Manitowoc, Manitowoc County Sheriff's Department. That's them using the double words, not me. Who is Tom Kasarek, as we as we all well know? Yes, what, we did look into that. Yeah, we did. Excellent. Let's let's find out how hard. But did one or more of them actually? Uh, do you know whether one or more of them actually did go to see? the sheriff and talk to him. Well, Mr. Bergner told us that he had gone to see the sheriff. Corroborates what Griesbach said, right? Uh, okay, and do you remember about what Mr. Berger told Mr. Bergner told you about what he told the sheriff? That he believed Allen was a viable suspect. So, you know, what? and you recall what Tom Kasarek said uh, when he was asked about, um, you know, seeing Bergner. Now, we know now from Griesbach's testimony that Penny Bernstein herself was there, which is, it's uncom how could you forget that? But, but Kasarek, I don't recall. I don't recall any, any such meeting. Um, I, I think Amy, uh, you know, a Amy seems to think that Kasarek's answer is kind of, kind of bold. So, you know, they go a little bit more, and there's some space in the deposition, but the notional question that comes up next is, how much time had elapsed before Bergner went to Kasur? I guess my understanding was it was relatively soon. I mean, they arrested Steve immediately, and there was concern that Alan was a viable suspect. So, so I believe it was, you know, in short order. He was talking to Kasurik but I don't know specifically how much time had passed. But short, short order kind of says it all though, doesn't it, Jeff? I, I think so, yeah. So- It was in um, short order. And, it, it, and isn't, that, isn't that just unbelievable? You know, you have a law enforcement officer, right? And the victim telling, not only did we have Gregory Allen under surveillance, but the victim herself saying, I've been getting these phone calls, right? And it's a common occurrence. And you know, you know, I, don't, what, I don't know what percentage means for common, but it's not an uncommon occurrence that a sexual predator will, will actually call their victim to help sort of, you know, some some perverse and, and disgusting way relive the... Well, they want to continue the abuse, right? They yeah, want to this, this is showing, right? That it, it, it's kind of showing us a couple things, right? First, it's showing us sort of who the overall mastermind was that sort of took over, right? That that was that was sort of puppeteering uh, in front of the scenes. People speculate: was it Vogel? Was it Kasurik? It was Kasurik, right? That there's, there's there's no there's no doubt about it. I don't know why, um, or I, you know, I, I'm I strongly suspect it was Kasurik. I don't want to make any any accusations here. Uh, this testimony would lead me to believe what I'm saying. I'm sure you have the right uh, trailers here. Uh, and and not, so look, look, just look at how brazen it is, right? So he, he's, he's the mastermind, and this was a setup from the beginning. He didn't even want to hear it from another law enforcement officer that you have the wrong guy. And he has two very, very strong points. And we're going to go over in a second some more very, very strong points. Uh, about why it wasn't Stephen that we've already been through on the why it couldn't have been Stephen, uh, you, you know. So, so just the 
you know, pe- people who say the 1985, oh, it was an accident, it was a case of police myopia, you know, where they just thought it was, and they just went in, in, in sort of investigate. Wrong, wrong. This was a setup from the, from the from the very beginning. They wanted him. Uh, they, uh, they they you know, from, from from the beginning they, they targeted him and they were going to right. And as we have seen and demonstrated that they were looking for him on other cases. Like this wasn't the first thing that they were trying to pin on him. They were going to pin. They were going to pin something on him. They were. De- it was the decision had been made. Yeah, that's, that's how right. I read it. It was like, uh, what are you going to do today at the first meeting of the week? The sheriff says to the deputies, what are you going to do this week? And their answer is try to find a way to lock up Stephen Avery. <laughs> you know, there's a rabbit hole theory. There, there, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a rabbit hole theory. Uh, I'm not saying that that's exactly what happened. I'm oh, no, I haven't told you the rabbit hole theory. It, it seems <laughs> like this. The, the rabbit hole theory I'm alluding to is one that uh, that Gre- that Gregory Allen on that day was actually acting as a pawn of law enforcement to deliberately, you know, set up and uh, to, to, to go, you know, do do what you want. You're going to get away with it. We're interested right. in framing Stephen. For those people who don't believe that there was a conspiracy uh, to frame Stephen for the Teresa Hallback murder. Take, take a good, hard look at this case. And between the time that uh, it, w- within 24 hours of Penny Bernston being attacked, Stephen Avery's in jail, right? And uh, there's a composite sketch done, a composite trace done of him. Uh, there's people visiting uh, the sheriff uh, with, within, you know, uh, what's, the, what's the right word? A, sh- a short amount of time <laughs> in short order. Telling him no, it wasn't probably wasn't him. We got this guy under surveillance. The victim saying, no, "I don't think it's him." Well, and what what other information do you need to know that this was a that this was a grand setup? You know, it's just uh, amazing. Well, so, the only other part is that that Stephen Avery had threatened the sheriff deputy's wife. That's the other that's the other part you need to know. That's and right. That this, this has all been revenge from that moment on. That. I mean, you, you, if you look at it through the perspective of Deb Strauss, for example, and the first thing she hears about Stephen Avery is that she held up the deputy sheriff's wife at gunpoint. That's all she needs to know about him in, in her mind. I am actually a very strong supporter of, of, the, of the police. Um, but, but when you think about what they're, what they're tasked with and what power that, that they have, when, when you when you have the power to take away somebody's liberty, that right. is the, that is an awesome power. I mean, so you know that that is just taking that away from a living human being is is just if if it's done for the wrong reasons is, is simply unconscionable, and therefore any supporter of the police should should also say, like I do, and join me in saying that when you find corruption, especially corruption at this level. You, you have no choice but to call it out and hold the people who are guilty of it accountable because it is the only way that it's going to stop. It's not going to stop any other way. The, the longer you get, you know, slap on the wrist, it's going to continue. It's, 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 the same, it's the same as condoning it or rubber stamping it. You have no choice. Right? All it takes is one good person to look the other way, ask Stephen Avery, you know what, we're better, we're better off. The town's a better place with him in jail. I don't care whether he did it or not. That, that that is the attitude that that is that is the road to tyranny right there. That's right. So again, we we, we talked about this uh, in both the discussing the murder podcast and the Deb Strauss deposition that we have Vogel um, making this great claim that I checked with Gregory Allen's parole officer and he was in Door County, so there's no way that he could have that he could have done this. And so let's uh, find out what. Um, you know what they what Amy Lehman has to say about it. Did so okay. Did you or to your knowledge did Miss Strauss make any effort to find out what the source of that probation was and what and to what crime it referred? I did not. <laughs> well, well, that's not you did not. She said, "Did you or did Miss Strauss?" Yeah, yeah. She's only, <laughs> she's only covering her own ass here. I did not. 
I, I, I believe that to be a truthful answer. It's again the complete lack of intellectual curiosity. Well, he 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 said this, so I, I he said it. I, that that's enough for me to um, that's enough for me to report. I'm reporting that he said it. Well, you know, you, did, you didn't go, you didn't press him at all. You know what I mean? If, if you if you were a police officer, you know, investigating a break in, or you had some potential suspect in custody for a violent crime or something like that, you give somebody the fifth, what do they call it, the third degree. You shine lights on him. And, yeah. Yeah. Does it does it sound to you like Vogel got the third degree on this question? He just admits he just got he just got caught in a whopper. You know, yeah. there is no friggin' parole officer. And do you think that you know law enforcement, uh, you know people trained in law enforcement would at least have the intellectual curiosity to ask the most obvious follow up question that exists on the planet, which is, well, what you know, where are you getting this from? Did you make well, it up on the law? It's a real mobster mentality, isn't it? Like you don't don't go beyond your scope, right? Yeah. You just you go through the motion and you don't ask questions. You, well, you have to ask this question, but you don't ask anything more. You know, you don't you don't go outside of your bounds because you're just you know like yeah. stay in your lane kind of thing. And you, you deviate from your lane and and you could get cut by the lawnmower blades, right? <laughs> that's right. Then you're not going to get promoted to narcotics, and then you're not going to get promoted to integrity unit, and then you're not going to get promoted to. I mean, it seems pretty oh, yeah. straightforward to me. If there was, the, you're, you're exactly right, and that's a really good point. That there are some higher. If if you're too, if you do too good of a job here, then then you you put your career at risk, right? And most people are career oriented, at least a little bit. That, that's it, right. Maybe they, maybe they don't aim. Maybe she doesn't want to be the attorney general, but she also doesn't want to be sweeping the streets either, right? Right. Or you, know, you don't want to be the one that brought down uh, or, tr or you know, brought or tried to bring down Manitowoc County and failed. Right. What if it all blows up in your face and you're like, then everyone hates you. You have no career and Manitowoc still gets away with it. You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, oh, yeah, yeah you're, you're a pariah. You're how a pariah. System works. Yeah, then you're a pariah. Yeah. OK, so she continues. Well, specifically. I don't remember what she wrote in her report, but I know that he could have been in the area at the time of the assault based upon the information she received from probation, from information she received from probation and parole. There was no parole. So I don't know who she's talking, I don't know if she's talking about. Me meaning, meaning that the story that you had heard, uh, that for some reason he was on probation in Door County, uh, could not have been and was an error correct correct I need, so, to, so. I need to read that again <laughs> meaning that the story that you had heard that for some reason he was on probation in door county and could not have been was an error correct yeah so the i'm not sure who the she is in that whether the she is um deb strauss or whether the she is somebody from the previous question who actually called and said there was no parole officer right right yeah, so that's that's it's a, I, I, you know, again, that when when we did this, uh, there was a rule against sharing too much. You couldn't read the depositions outright, so I had to just grab the paragraphs that were that were meaningful. But the point is, as you can tell, there was zero interest, as we just talked about, in determining where this information actually came from regarding the fact that there was a probation officer. Period. Dot. So. With that, we can go on to the next. If you're going to get probation, you get it in Door County, right? That's right. <laughs> they don't know what's going on. They don't even – they have ghost probation officers there that don't even exist. <laughs> Maybe they have ghost jails too. Although if you yeah. ever get to the area, Door County is one of the most beautiful areas in Wisconsin. Oh, that's nice. Just to remember, yeah. It's a yeah. peninsula. Remember, at the very beginning of the Deb Strauss interview, part of the initial uh, discussion was, you know, to Deb, how, were you influenced by the order of people you went to and, you know, uh, that, that, that type of thing? Let's let's compare and contrast what Amy and Deb say about about that, those specific issues. So question to Amy. OK, but the decisions concerning who you might interview after any particular interview were made by the attorneys in the attorney general's office or by you and Deb Strauss or by some combination? Combination. So there was feedback going on back and forth about, well, who should you do next? That sort of thing. 
there probably there probably was some of that. Probably, I like how they, she answers that question. <laughs> and in those conversations, uh, in those conversations in which you were mostly, uh, uh, which you were mostly often talking was was Jennifer Nashville, right? And that that would I and I left that question in because. It's Jennifer Nashold who who they're saying made these decisions or, or was probably uh, influencing who ought to be interviewed next. Now, probably, probably. So what is what does Deb say? Let's let's maybe maybe, you know, harken back, talk, hop into the time machine and go to Deb Strauss's interview when she's asked about the same sort of flow of events. Question. Uh, were you directed in the selection of witnesses by the attorneys with whom you spoke to in the Department of Justice? No. <laughs> I believe it's possible we would have notified them as to who we were talking to. But you and Amy made the decisions, not them. I believe so. I <laughs> believe so. You don't remember if you made the decision or not in your own report? Yeah. <laughs> so so we we have Amy telling us that there's likely influence from the Department of Justice coming back. And that's why I said Amy's a little bit more forthcoming about information. Maybe that's the right. fact that she's a little bit junior and doesn't know what a defense attorney might harp on. But doesn't that right. stink high hell that you know that, that the investigators really don't have free reign of how to take this investigation? Uh, and that they have to go, you know, uh, to, to the next people who they're told to. And again, as you probably as you indicated, uh, they're probably either directed about the scope of that interview or have a very strong sense of becoming a pariah with regards to the level of questioning that that they can that they can get. So right, put her in the garage. Right. Is, isn't it isn't it amazing? <laughs> so that evidence of influence, oh, just to, just to higher up, right? I just smell Tom Fallon lurking in the background because from when it came to the lawyer side, he's always puppeteering that guy. So, hmm. So our friend, our, our good friend, Michael Griesbach. Uh, so again, uh, Michael Griesbach question, hearkening back, they, you know, they, they jump all over time here. Uh, did Griesbach tell you whether or not he had any concerns about Vogel having contacted him and, and inquired about whether there was material concerning Gregory Allen in the Ooh. DA's file? Did Griesbach convey to us he was concerned? Yeah. I don't know that he. I don't know that he conveyed he was concerned, but he wrote a memo about it. Which you know, if you're concerned about, well, I guess concerned. If you want to document contact, you always write it down. I'm asking if he elaborated on the memo. Oh. Uh, and and he said to you anything that that uh, you remember about his concerns. No. I just remember him saying he was contacted and he wrote it down. Okay. So let's talk about again. We said it before, but let's quickly go over what Griesbach uh, says in his book. Do you, do you want to read it this time? So at least it sounds a little different to the audience. Yeah, sure. That's just fine. Um, I hung up the phone and I just sat there in my office for a while, reflecting upon our conversation. Vogel's question, is there anything on Alan in the file? implied he knew that Alan, not Avery, was the assailant, didn't it? He was covering his tracks, and he must have thought I'd go along. How else could I take it? Despite their reputations, most attorneys possess a m much integrity as the next person, and maybe even more. Dennis Vogel appeared to be one of the exceptions. How could he prosecute someone he knew was innocent? And how could he let someone as dangerous as Gregory Allen go free? So, so Griesbach, ha, you know, writes, writes this memo and, uh, and again, not really contacted by Amy. Either, either he is and he talks about this or Amy doesn't remember. Right. There's only two choices there. Right. So, uh, you know, it, it, Griesbach wasn't shy about writing this in his book. And, and uh, you know, there was a lot of concerns that were identified in, in the, not only in the sheriff's office, but in the DA's office. Right. It's the three women who worked in the DA's office. We highlighted uh, Deb Strauss's questioning re re related to them, who said this sounds a lot more like Alan than, than, than Avery. But we have this note uh, from, uh, from, from, from Griesbach. 
uh, you know, and the attorneys are asking, did he document his concerns, right? I, I can only uh, assume that the concerns that he's talking about are concerns related to how any behavior here might put negatively implicate the state, right? And certainly the the existence of the, uh, this, uh, you know, the, the of the Allen of, of the Allen um, assault that happened very near the location where Penny Bernstein was assaulted, in the, and around the same time of day, that that was actually in the Avery file, and that and that's what that's what uh, Griesbach is talking about in that particular th in that particular segment, and uh, you know, you, you'd think that if um, Griesbach was interested in maybe giving the uh, you know, the investigators, some, you know, prime them with some piece of information that they might, eat, might want to either more deeply investigate or perhaps hope to, uh, you know, dispel. So, you know, so that could be put in Peg's report. That, that, that at least it would be there. He's not going to hide that piece of information, right? So, uh, you know, where, so where is it? And, and why, and Amy, why the F can't you remember? And there's no accountability if you can have your, if you can have your supervisor stamp of approval on anything that you say there's no accountability as long as they go along with it right sure. because if someone can clear you oh well you know it's just like it's just like how uh mark Rohr handed off the investigation he's like just to make just to be clear we're not running the investigation we're having our good pals from calumet that i hand picked right to run the investigation right and it's just like right. this it's like how can you trust it's all you know it's it's almost like you need another state to investigate or you know a federal yeah, agency yeah, or something yeah, like, yeah. how can you trust a state to investigate the state's own dirty long laundry yeah. who's and watching the just, right and so it's just like well well we, you know we made a report slap your hands together a couple times and <laughs> see folks we did it and it's just like you, you went through the motions you check the boxes you threaded the needle on statements that needed to be adjusted so they'd be accepted in the public realm and you just move on no not, not we didn't do nothing to see here folks it's 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 it shocks the conscience that's the only way to shameful yeah so moving on <laughs> right yeah more, more evidence that this was really you know the, who was who really the godfather puppeteer going on here um he you know Kasurik, uh we have amy layman admitting and documenting that kasurik handled this investigation the 1985 investigation atypically right isn't this isn't that isn't that interesting right so he did not follow the normal procedure that you'd expect and, and let's let's sort of uh, dig into what amy says about that uh, and at the end of the second paragraph, Belts tells you that the ordinary investigative process for crimes being investigated in the sheriff's department was not followed by Kisarek in the case of the assault on Penny Bernstein. Yeah, it was his. It was his take that this one was handled differently. And another question is yeah, asked. Here, and it appeared from this investigation that the sheriff was really involved in this one, which wasn't the norm. Are we are we shocked yet? <laughs> Belts told you he was a little doubtful about Avery had uh, about Avery uh, having been the correct suspect. Yes. Uh, and he said in the next paragraph, he told you those doubts came from the fact that the photo line lineup came up so fast. And that there was someone in law enforcement saying it was Avery. Yes. Well, again, remember <laughs> that Judy Devor Judy Dvorak never admitted to uh, being the one that it sounds like Stephen Avery. Well, right. somebody said it. somebody said it because that's what's verified by the uh, the Belts testimony. And that would have been hearsay, right, in a, in a real trial, like we said. Um, but just just amazing, just amazing. So Kasura can live very differently. He took a leadership role, uh, being, being really involved. He's not supposed to do that, right? He's supposed to oversee what what, what everybody else is doing. Not because he's supposed to be a rubber stamp. Not <laughs> <That's right. laughs> he's, he's the rubber stamper of the other people. Yeah, he's not supposed to be in the involved in the party. He's just supposed to rubber stamp everything. Right. But on right. this right. one, he was more than a rubber stamp. 
he got his yeah. hands dirty. That's right. See, and and just again, just speaks to the fact that it was it was handled differently, atypically. Why? Because it was set up from the very beginning. And there, there. And anybody who doesn't think that um, really needs to, you know, th think think twice. Um, okay. Next, uh, what, was there really any investigation done at all? Because we we know that they that that that, that neither both Deb and uh, Amy d didn't really think that there was any real investigation, and that's common knowledge. Any investigation done? A uh, question. Here's the question. That's an exchange of email between you and Deb on the one hand, and the attorneys in Madison on the other hand about the progress of the investigation. Yes. And that takes place, I believe, on October 22nd of 2003, well into the investigation. Yes. Let me just see that for a moment, if I might. Is, is it true that on that occasion, you and Deb tell the lawyers that it appears to the two of you that there was really no investigation done by the sheriff's department, uh, that they had a suspect and they were going to make it work, uh, and that's what's a little troubling to you is the lack of paperwork that's done and so forth. Uh, he's quoting, he's ba or or not maybe not hard quoting, but soft quoting the email that Deb and Amy sent back to uh, to Madison. And yeah. that their conclusion was, well, they didn't do a lot of paperwork. Yeah, it's a little troubling. Just a, not a lot there troubling. Are all these, there were all these people. Well, because that's like that is a infraction that can be dealt with with a slap on the wrist right yeah it's like it's like no mom i didn't break the cookie jar i just ate the cookies <laughs> and around the floor what was right. i doing i guess in a sense she's right because there would have been paperwork if you would have done the investigation <laughs> they had a suspect and they were going to make it work that's right and and, right. and and the suspect just happened to be the one guy that because Sarah had his eyes on him. Amazing, amazing, just just astounding. And I think probably the reason why I didn't put an answer there is because there was probably a slew of uh, objections uh, to that. Mm. So so the the the, the, the follow up question that ends up being asked is, well, let me ask it another way. Can I ask it another way? Is there, to your knowledge, is there any communication by you and Deb speaking for each other? in which you change what you say in that email on the 22nd of October. No. So, so in other words, she doesn't recant that statement. Anymore. Right. Exactly. Even though she has the opportunity further on, it's, it's only halfway through the investigation, maybe you change your mind. right? But, so, so it's well into the investigation, but it's not the end. But do you still feel like that? Did you, did you ever send another email recanting that? No. So that, that must be the way they still feel, because otherwise they would have certainly recanted such a, such a harsh statement. There you go. Just, they, they, they didn't even think, you know, it, the people trying to whitewash it didn't even think. <laughs> so, so, so in that, that was really the kind of the end of, uh, you know, Stephen Glenn um, questioning or, or uh, Kelly's questioning of, of Deb. And it comes time for the cross-examination, right? Because you know that the lawyers are um you know the, the the many many lawyers are involved in this now, very very interestingly these questions that i'm going to ask now come from vogel's lawyer okay okay come from vogel's Let, lawyer let's try and ask ourselves when we get done with these questions why would vogel's lawyer be asking these questions and does it look if, if you look at the next page does the witness give uh, an identification? The victim, the, the victim, give an identification of her attacker. She described him as five ten and quite chubby, flabby, thin, almost bald hair, bushy blonde mustache, no glasses, about thirty years old. Okay, all right. Let's go to the beach incident at the page. Uh, I think it's at uh, Bates five four zero five. Okay, go back one more page. Okay. Is that a sheet applicable to the August 2nd incident, 1983? Yes, it looks like it. Okay, and does it identify on the first page, on the page before, how tall Mr. Allen was? Five foot ten. And how much did he weigh? 200 pounds. Okay. So does, does Stephen look like someone 
let's go through these things one by one. Is Stephen 5'10"? I don't think he is. I think he's shorter. He's more like four, five, four or five, five is more is more like it for him, right? They, right. We, we can find that picture right from the uh, from 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 the mugshot. Stephen short, um, quite chubby. Steve, Stephen, you know, uh, around the time when he'd been sitting in jail for a year uh, up to the trial, he he got a little bit of a gut on him. But okay. 1985, he was in pretty good shape. That's what I'm saying. I didn't think he looked chubby or flabby. I don't think that. Alan did either at the time, to be honest. Well, the, the Penny's describing him. This is Penny's description of him. Uh, was That's was right. flabby, so you know, uh, may, maybe she's uh, yeah, she wasn't fitness no, instructor. So maybe, maybe she's a little overly critical. Right, <laughs> maybe. Um, almost bald hair, thin, almost bald hair. What? Look at okay, okay so look at that picture of Stephen Avery. <laughs> like you can't tell me that that's almost balding hair, and then look at a picture of Gregory Allen and tell me that that's hey that actually is kind of almost balding hair. Uh, now what about this bushy blonde mustache? Does that look like in that mugshot picture? No glasses, about thirty. Neither one of them wore glasses. It's a weird it's a weird thing to add. No glasses. Most people don't wear glasses, do they? I don't know. Maybe they wear question. sunglasses on the beach, but so yeah. Okay, so fair enough. I, I get n n none of the, none of those things. None really fit the, even the picture. So so again, this, despite despite the Gene the pencil couches trace job, mm -hmm. right? We it is very difficult to apply the description that Penny Bernstein gave to Stephen Avery. That doesn't sound like him one bit. Okay, and we didn't even discuss the eye color, which um, which Penny said was brown, and Stephen's eyes are blue, right? So there there is nothing about this that points to Stephen Avery, at, you know, about 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 this description. Nothing, zero. What and again? Why is why is Vogel's lawyer asking this question? Well, it's, he's reinforcing the fact that. This is on Penny. It could be. This is all. This is all her mistake. See, and if you look at this, I think he catches Amy in a lie because if if Stephen Avery isn't actually five foot ten, why does she say five foot ten? So you talk about this about how tall Gregory Allen was. Oh, okay. Oh, Mr. Allen was five foot ten. Yeah. There you go. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for correcting. So, 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 so suppose, suppose Vogel was getting cold feet. So maybe you can say, well, this is I, it, it's to me, it's hard to throw Penny under but under the bus with regard to the initial description, because the initial description is accurate. Right. So right. if it wasn't Penny's fault in the beginning that got Stephen arrested, whose fault was it? Not Vogel's, because Vogel's, law, Vogel's lawyer is asking these questions. He's right. pointing the finger. Yeah. At Kassurik. this wasn't this wasn't the district. The district attorney just prosecute the cases that the, the police department gives them. This is on Kassurik, right. not me. Right. That that's how that's how I read this. Uh, and later so, again, so the so the tables are turning a little bit, and we're seeing that in the depositions, we're seeing lawyers turning against other you know clients turning against clients. That's right. And in the Jennifer, as like I said, in the Jennifer Nashold uh, interview about what seeking truth for good writes that Reddit article. I, I hope and I hope it's uh, I hope it's seeking because now I've given somebody the wrong credit. There was a section, a whole section on Vogel that Tom Fallon just edited out. So do you think Vogel was getting cold feet? So was Vogel ready to turn? Because he was getting nervous and Stephen really wanted to serve. I think Stephen could have cared less about Vogel. I think he wanted to serve. He wanted the cops. So that that's that's what I think. So that that's kind of that's interesting evidence from that perspective. Um, and again, more under cross examination, uh, they say, "Oh yeah, okay. Well, the, the witness did positively identify Stephen at the trial. There, there's your blaming on Penny. That exactly what you were talking about. Um, and uh, isn't it true that?" Uh, Gregory Allen, who they, who the, who the, um, uh, the uh, Manitowoc Police Department had nicknamed the Sandman, right? Why did, why did they call him the, uh, the, the Sandman? Um, 
Well, that's that's because he did most of his activity at night, except for one time, and that one time happened to be the folder, you know, that the case discussion was the folder that happened to be included in the Stephen Avery case file of when he committed that incident at almost the same place in 1983 uh, on the beach. So it wasn't always at night, um, but you know, in another case, in exactly in the exact same spot, it was at during well, the day. It's kind of telling when you're when a uh, perpetrator or a suspect has a nickname. So, so I, you know, just it's it's astounding, right? They they were tailing Gregory Allen. He was active for for years and years and years. They couldn't pin anything on him. But when they want Stephen Avery to go away, boy, my God, it's like snapping him. You know, David Copperfield couldn't do a better job of snapping his fingers and making Stephen Avery go away in two microseconds, right? Well, you know, I was joking about this, you know, in one of our other podcast where I was like, you know, oh, somebody graffitied the side of the building must be Stephen Avery. Oh, right. you know, somebody drained the pool must be Stephen Avery. You know, it's like I was making a joke of that. But the more you dig into this, the more that it, that's what it sounds like in, in the police department. I'm, I'm not I'm not trying like that's what they're joking about. This is this is what's on the tip of their tongue talking yeah. about rumors about Stephen Avery and whether he did or didn't do it, or is this a good one to pin on him? Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. Look, when they're going through the shoes at the Dassey house, so let's check these against them. And they have their idea who the criminals are and who they're going to harass and look up. You know, just so, to, like, to just, this on a bigger on a bigger statement, that leads me to believe that they were just waiting for something to get him on, and this fell in their laps. And that's that's what tends to make me think that if it wouldn't have been this, you know, you know, the disappearance of Teresa Hallbuck, it would have been the next major crime in Manitowoc that they would have tried to pin on him. And I and and that's reflected through the day before Penny was raped, they were trying to pin an abduction on Stephen. They or people were talking, right? This was the talk of the t- so anyway, that's that's just my bigger comment on the case i guess i think you're i think you're exactly right i i, re, I really do uh, redirect so oh, again absolutely. the opposing lawyers are off the stage uh and steven's lawyers get to back get back on the stage to ask the final questions right of, of, the, of the day the redirect um question you and miss strauss interviewed arland avery who told you certain things about what he saw in terms of cement chalk on the shoulders of Stephen Avery on the evening he was arrested. Do you remember that? Yes. And Arvin, Arlen Avery also told you about a conversation he had with District Attorney Vogel concerning uh, concerning his prospective testimony about that, uh, what he had seen. I believe so. And what's your recollection of what he told uh, told you that District Attorney Vogel told him about what he was to say concerning that residue of chalk. Can I look at my report? Is it in there? (laughs) The answer is no, you can't look at your uh, report. So you're just gonna have to be left with that non-answered question. Uh, So again, it was, it was directly, they they talked, they talked to Ireland, told him about the chalk, right? They didn't say, they didn't say that it wasn't there. Also the next question wouldn't, wouldn't happen, right? And they told right. they told them that Vogel said something to Alan. Uh, t- sorry, that Vogel said something to Arland uh, about whether or not he could say, but but she can't remember what it is. And we do not have the 529 um, that was written about that investigation. So can I look at the report? And that's actually a very common thing. I mean, look, take I don't know if you guys uh, look at the look at the Mueller uh, deposition in front of Congress when he reported out on his report. It's like, is it, is it in the report? Then I stand by the report. That, that, that's what they that's what they do. They don't want to contradict their their final report. That's a very common sure. law enforcement yeah. kind of answer. Stand by the report. What did it say in the report? But again, did, do, you think, do you think any of that made, did any of that make Peg's final report? No, that law, because no. Uh, not, important, not an important aspect. It seems like something that would be at the kickoff meeting, to to be honest. Like, <laughs> and, and there's this and there's this claim that another officer was going to file a report and he uh, pressured him. That's the second part to this investigation. That would be the two prong that I'm looking at. 
which what else would you be discussing at the kickoff meeting? Where the good fast food is on the way? You guys are... <laughs> Again, you go, you go, when you go back to the beginning, it maybe would be a good time to flash the, the goals of the report. Uh, you know, what, what, was, there, was there any uh, misconduct or any impropriety done? Right. You know, was, was, and, and, you know, the, you know, the question that we have after seeing these two depositions was, was there really any digging done to find out, uh, you know, any of this stuff, uh, you know, how, where any of this misinformation came from? Uh, were any of these bigwigs, Kasurik, Vogel, were they put really to any type of uh, serious uh, follow-up questions or, or deeper investigations regarding the way that they acted? or uh you know the, the you know, things that they said to that you know that seemed exculpatory to gregory allen and in, inculpatory to stephen the, the, the answer is clearly no right and on november 10th tom kasurik was scheduled to give his deposition where he was going to have to answer those questions and it wasn't it, i think it was within within two weeks i don't remember the exact date dennis vogel was going to have to do the same thing sit under oath and explain, you know, what was this probation thing? Why did you say this to Ar what, 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 what did you, do you recall saying this to Arlen Avery? This because we, we had this testimony. Of course, so, you know, there would have been a massive uh, forgetting of, of things or maybe even a, a Fifth Amendment uh, in, in invo invocation. But I'll tell you what, if he'd ever pled the Fifth, that would have been the, that would have been the end of it. Uh, for, for everybody. So it's just when, when, I, when I say that man miracle number one, is Teresa Hallback going missing and Stephen Avery getting arrested the day before, uh, uh, not even on murder, right? Uh, he Because he wasn't going anywhere. Stephen Avery was not going anywhere. He was not running. He actually thought about running. He talked to his old man about it. Uh, and the old man told him, uh, Alan Avery, if you're innocent, you shouldn't you shouldn't run because if you're guilty, it makes it look, makes it look bad on you. He didn't. Uh, he actually was arrested at his brother Earl's house. Uh, and uh, you know, and that, and that's sort of we, we we know we know how it goes from there because we watched the uh, the Uyghur, uh interview on on November 9th from there. But it's it is absolutely astounding and the, the 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 miracle of all times that Stephen is arrested on November 9th for for this for, for this for this crime. The way that you know you hear those recordings of do we have him in custody yet? Do we even have a body? <laughs> right like, they're like do we have him do we have, we've arrested him though right that 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 comment that you just brought up that we have Avery in custody yet tells you that they knew damn well what they were headed there to do and that was arrest Stephen Avery. you know pin, pin it on Stephen Avery. He, he wasn't there obviously but uh that, that's why we're, that's why we're headed here right this is all about Stephen Avery I don't care that car's there she's there so it's just uh, it's just well. so there we have it, man miracle number one. Uh, I, I think you know maybe if uh, you know the response is good to these, then we can go over the Reddit post of uh, seeking uh, seeking truth for good. I'm pretty sure, my God, I hope it's I hope it's seeking, uh, and uh, and that that would be uh, Jennifer Nashold's. Uh, it's just it's just an interesting story, right? The, the, it's just it's just like the case itself. The digger, the deeper you dig, the the you know, the more it stinks. It's like peeling an onion, right? It, it, uh, there, there, there's right. all you find is more onion, and it stinks just it stinks worse. It makes your eyes water hard. All right. Well, yeah. I hope uh, if people do have you know have shown interest in this, we'll do we'll do more like you said. Um, you have anything to add? I, I'm I'm just like, exasperated by the level of corruption. You know, it, it, all it takes, all it takes, is one good person to turn their head and look away for to, for for this for this to be enabled. All right, well, fantastic little uh, video, and uh, um, we'll keep everybody posted about you know videos that we do like this in the future. And yeah, we'll leave it in the comments. Ahead. What do you want to see yeah. more? Check it out and yeah, hit hit us up in the comments. Hit like and subscribe uh, to support the channel. And this has been discussing a murder extras.